Okay, so today is March 2nd. Uh, today is a Tuesday. We are working on quiz number 10 that is going to count as your attendance for the class today. Uh, please go on grade scope anytime during the day today to answer that. Um, in terms of what is due, homework five is due tonight. Uh, it's mainly uh, KMAP related questions. Um, and now that you have given an exam on that, things should be pretty simple. Uh, hopefully you will get done with homework five in time. I will also be posting homework six later on uh, today. Is grade scope down? I do not know. Uh, so Arnav says it's not for me. David says it works. I just did the quiz just fine. Works fine for me. Okay, so now if I think it's uh, your browser maybe misbehaving. Yeah. All right. What else? In terms of studio, uh, I hope you guys uh, have started working on studio number three, which is based on structural or modular VHDL, uh, uh, slightly different uh, from uh, studio one and two. And to get you guys up to speed uh, about structural VHDL, how, what is the concept, what's the necessity, and uh, how do you go about designing several modules and then design a top level modules a uh, top level module that kind of brings everything together uh, th that's about studio 3 so i've recorded a video posted it on uh, piazza under studio resources so if you watch that before starting the studio it will help you uh, you know go through it uh, faster than if you would without it um, when can we expect our exam scores back so friday i will be uh, showing you guys the distribution of the class, how they did on exam one. So the grading is underway. Uh, so the, the 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 solutions are already posted on Piazza. Please feel free to take a look at that. Uh, but the exam scores, please expect that uh, to be discussed on Friday afternoon in our class. Uh, let's see. For Studio 3, again, a TH checkoff as well as a studio report on Gradescope uh, is required. And I will also be posting Studio 4, which is a design of a 4-bit ALU. Uh, I, will uh, I will post that uh, either later today or tomorrow. It will be due Wednesday, March 17th. So you have a week after Studio 3 is due. That's when Studio 4 will be due. Uh, questions, concerns? right so today we are going to talk about glitches and hazards and you know so so far we have been uh, you know not not specifically be focusing on one of the key issues in logic design which is gate delay so today we are, what we are going to do is see how a delay through each gate can cause some serious problems in terms of a glitch which means an error and it could also lead to situations that uh, that give you a wrong logic function result so gate delay is sort of the culprit uh, for for today's class right that's the that's the problem and as i have pointed earlier uh, gate delay will actually help us to uh, build some sequential uh, circuits it will ha uh, actually help us to uh, incorporate memory into our logic diagrams, into our uh, logic circuits. So gate delay is not necessarily a bad thing in general. Gate delay is going to be the problem for today. But when we move on to sequential circuits, it's actually going to help us. So what is a glitch? What is a static hazard? What are you trying to detect? And what are you trying to eliminate? So we are going to be focusing on static hazards. We are going to try to eliminate static hazards, not just detect them, but also eliminate static hazards. So there is a lot, a lot of terminology that will come your way today. 
we'll start with defining a prime implicant. And the definitions I'm going to work through are for the sum of product case. So this is sum of product prime implicant. And of course, if you switch them around from ones to zeros, you will have a product of sum prime implicant and so on, right? So we are going to be focusing on the ones and the story kind of repeats the same, but instead of looking at the ones, you will be looking at the zeros. So what is a prime implicant? Prime implicant are all the possible groups of ones. All possible groups of ones. Not the simplest, but all of them. What is not allowed is for you to break a group of four ones into two groups of two ones, right? So you cannot take a big group of four and then break it down into uh, two smaller groups of two ones and call them two prime implicants. For example, you have a, a, a group of four over here you, 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 so that would be a prime implicant. However, you cannot just break them into two groups of two ones and call them both prime implicants. So that is not allowed. Breaking a bigger group into smaller groups is not allowed. That would not qualify as a prime implicant. Now, again, as I said, this is for the ones because it is a sum of product prime implicant. When you switch this to zero, then it would be a product of sum PI prime implicant. So that includes four, absolutely, four, eight, 16, all of them, right? So you cannot break a group of eight ones into smaller groups, whether it be four or two or down to one. So that's not, that would not qualify, the smaller groups would not qualify as prime implicants. All right, so let's work through some examples to see what, uh, how do you identify prime implicants uh, in three of these examples. There's another question in the chat box that would introduce the redundant prime implicant, I assume. Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, so they are, they are, uh, let's work through the terminology to see what is a prime implicant, what is essential, what is redundant. So let's work through the first one. And I've already made this three variable K map. I have entered the ones, the blanks are zeros. This particular function depends on A, B, and C. It's a three variable K map. And I'm going to try to identify all possible groups of ones. And I hope you guys uh, are quickly going to say, all right, I see one group right here. I see another group right here. And that would lead to my simplest form of this function. However, there is also one additional prime implicant, which is right here. I don't need that, it is redundant, but that would also qualify as a prime implicant. So I've got three of them here, right? So uh, I can quickly note down what, what, what the product terms are. Again, I'm doing this for the sum of product case. So I'm going to be three prime implicants, exactly right. So I'm going to be uh, writing down the product terms for each of these groups. So for the blue guy, first one, you have A complement and C complement. For the second blue guy, I have uh, B and C. And for the red term, I have A complement and B. So two of them are essential. One of them is redundant, but all three of them are PIs, prime implicants. How about over here? Let's go through the second example here to identify the prime implicants. How many do you see over here? All you have to be careful of is that you cannot break a bigger group into smaller groups and call it uh, a, a prime implicant. So two, right? Absolutely right. So you see two prime implicants over here. Again, the goal is to make, uh, you know, different groups, right? So I have a group in blue right here. And I have another group which wraps around. So those two would be my prime implicants. And in this case, I can just uh, find out the product terms here. This is going to be A0, so A complement. And for this guy, it would be uh, B0, so B complement, right? Let me also highlight them so that you can clearly see it. I've got two prime implicants over there. I've got three prime implicants over there. 
again, I have not broken the four into smaller two groups, right? Like I have not broken them down. I've only, I don't, I only have two sum of product prime implicants in this case. Just for the sake of completeness, let's ask a related question here. If you were to identify a product of some prime implicant for the same function, how many product of some prime implicants would you have for this same example? So P O S P I. How many of them? Just one, right? Because zeros would go over here and you would combine those two and that would be there, right? And what would you call it? Well, A is a one, B is a one. Uh, a complement or B complement, right? So that would be your product of some prime implicant. Let's take, an, uh, take a, another example. Here is an interesting problem and I, I like it a lot because it opens your mind up to uh, quite a few possibilities. So the K map that you're seeing here is a four variable K map. And my, my goal is to identify all the sum of product prime implicants for this particular K map. So can you guys start thinking about um, what all are possible? How many prime implicants am I going to see here? Jeremy says four, Alex says eight, eight. So eight is an answer. Yeah, eight, eight. That's right. So there are eight prime implicants in this example. Let us, uh, let us try to identify them. Uh, I'm going to label the horizontal ones in blue. So I've got one here, one here, one here, and one here. So I've got four of those as horizontal sum of product prime implicants. Four horizontal SOP PIs. And some of you might have started simplifying it in a different way. Vertical ones. One two, three, and four. So you've got four horizontal ones, and then you've got four vertical. Sum of product PIs. So in total, there are eight of them, right? Eight uh, uh, prime implicants. SOP prime implicants. Now, I'm going to ask a, a slightly different question here, and let's see if we are able to answer this or not. Set of prime implicants, is that equal to question mark tower or not? So we are trying to find out whether this state, well, let, uh, let us pose this as a true or false. Is this true or false? set of all PIs for a function, is that going to give you a cover for a function? What I mean by cover of a function is if all the ones are part of a, a group, one group at least. What do you guys think? Set of PIs is cover of a function. True or false? Alex says true. Let's try to validate his answer by looking at the prime implicants that we saw for the three examples. In the first case, we had three prime implicants. And as you can see, it, they cover all the ones. All the ones are part of at least one group. 
in the second case all the ones are part of at least one group in the third case all the ones are part of at least one group so a set of prime implicants will cover the function if you are doing this for some of product prime implicants then you are looking at covering all the ones if you are doing this for a product of some prime implicants then you are looking at covering all the zeros but this statement if i do this for some of product this statement is absolutely true so this is as far as prime implicants are concerned and you can actually classify prime implicants into two categories one is essential the other is redundant so let's talk about what is an essential prime implicant in short epi so the definition is if there is at least one one in a prime implicant that particular prime implicant is going to be an essential prime implicant so let us try to identify essential prime implicants for the three examples that we already saw now let's try to first uh, identify the prime implicants i had one over here i had another one over here and i had another one over here and i was choosing red for some reason and let's talk about that color choice later on so how many of them are essential and how many of them are non-essential which means redundant what i would have to do is uh, two of them are essential one of them is non-essential absolutely i would actually go through and take a look at all the ones right so this particular one is only in that one group so it is essential in other words if i did not have that prime implicant that particular blue group then i would not have a complete cover of the function so that group blue group becomes essential to cover all the ones and the same story for the last one bottom right one right that one only belongs to one group so that blue group becomes essential so i have two epis in this case uh, that would be one of them this would be another one epis and then this guy would be redundant prime implicant the set of essential prime implicants is the set which covers the function with the fewest prime implicants that is absolutely the right way of looking at it yes is a set which covers the function with the fewest prime implicants uh yes but there is a special case Let, let's let's talk about um let's talk about essential prime implicants a little bit more <laughs> no are redundant prime implicants are redundant all right so let's take a look at the next example how many uh, essential prime implicants do you see in the second example two of them right so this was one group and then this was one group and clearly these two ones are part of only that group and these two ones are part of only that group so both would be essential in this case both essential all right how about here we had four horizontal ones and then four vertical ones how many essential prime implicants are there four epis two different sets possible uh actually all the ones in this particular example are part of two groups which means none of them are essential no epis 
in other words the set of epis let us ask this question again but in this case we will try to modify the question because we are focusing on the epis now the question is slightly different the question is set of epis equals cover of a function true or false false yes so now it's going to be false because it is possible that you have no essential prime implicates you see that all the ones two ones two groups two groups two groups two groups two groups two groups every one belongs to more than one group Yes, so it depends. Yes, absolutely. So it depends upon how you are grouping them, right? Like what are the, first you would try to find out all the prime implicates, then you would start looking at uh, whether your ones are part of one group or more than one group. Why is this terminology useful? Because it, it, uh, when you start looking at glitches and hazards, you can fix a hazard by adding a redundant prime implicant to a function. Because if you don't have that redundant prime implicant added to a function, a static hazard is uh, possible. So it's directly related to hazard uh, elimination. We will do a, quite a few examples to, to see that. Now, Let's talk about redundant prime implicant. Redundant is, of course, non essential, right? So, uh, is a group in which all ones belong to more than one group? That is going to be your redundant prime implicant. Again, we have uh, three groups here one being redundant, RPI, because it has ones that are part of more than one group so in other words even if i removed it right even if i removed it i would still be covering all the ones so the red one is sort of redundant it's not it's not useful to actually uh, cover the function but it is there like i said to eliminate a static hazard possibility Next one, is there a redundant prime implicant in this case? Second example, any RPI here? No, no RPI here. No redundant prime implicant. Because even if I remove one of the, one of the prime implicants, I will lose complete cover. So I cannot remove any, both are essential, no RPI. How about over here? How many redundant prime implicants do you see over here? Eight, absolutely right. All of them are redundant. All eight PIs are RPIs. Because all of those groups have ones that belong to more than one group. All right, questions about the terminology and how do you identify PI, EPI, RPI? given a function. Okay. Now let's talk about a glitch. Uh, does EPI plus RPI equal uh, total PIs? Absolutely right. Yes, it does. Because pro prime implicants are categorized as one, this one or this one, right? 
So if you add up the categories, then you get the PIs. All right, now let's talk about a glitch. Where does it come from? Like I said, it comes from the gate delay. A plus A complement equals one. Yes, that's what I would expect. I would expect this to be one all the time, right? Because Boolean algebra says X or X complement should be one. However, does that really, uh, is that really the case when it comes to, come, comes to wiring up a circuit? So if you start looking at uh, a, a logic diagram, over here we have a logic diagram in which we are using this particular input to control the value of X, can be one or a zero, indicated by a low level or a high level. And it looks like we are changing it, like right? low, then high, after some time low and high and so on. So if I keep changing this, you would expect based on this particular function that f should be one, regardless of what x is. So if it's low or if it is high, no matter what it is over here, you would expect this guy to be one, a high value all the time. But is that going to be the case? It's actually going to get spoiled because of this particular not gate, which is required to do this. Uh, the, I see. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. So what, I, what I'll do is I will start off with assuming that X is a one, right? This is what is controlling my X, the, in, the input binary variable. So I'll say this is one. If I make that a one, I have a one over here, but I have this guy as a zero, but that doesn't happen uh, immediately. That happens slightly later. Right, because of this guy having a gate delay. And here I have an OR gate and one OR zero will keep this at a one. Right now it's all okay. Things are good because I was expecting a one based on my logic function. And I got a one over here because this was available. Now let's try to change it. Let's try to change this guy from one to a zero. The moment you change the input from one to a zero, this guy changes immediately. One to a zero. But this guy doesn't change immediately, right? Takes time. It might be few, uh, you know, nanoseconds, one, two nanoseconds. But for that short duration of time, this guy changed to zero immediately. This guy remained at zero for that small amount of time, making this a zero, right? So this goes from one to a zero. And then as soon as this guy jumps to a one, after that time, it'll go, it'll go to a one. So you, you get the one that you expect, but in the middle, you have an accidental zero. Would adding a buffer help? It, it will help, but you see this, how, it's not going to be a practical approach to keep adding buffers to your logic circuits because here we are talking about just one input, right? You can absolutely fix that or uh, you can fix the timing, uh, timing defects in a circuit by adding buffers. But there's an alternate when it comes to uh, static hazards which is what we can do by, by uh, use adding a, that uh, redundant prime implicant. Wouldn't that only be the case if the propagation delay was the same as the buffer? Yes. Yep. The, the buffer's propagation delay has to exactly match the not gate propagation delay. 
only then it will fix it. But that is one way to fix it. But the problem is how many such cases am I going to try to fix using buffers? It might get out of my hand very quickly. Instead, there is another way of fixing such problems. We'll take a look at that. So here, what is this called? I was expecting a one. Instead, I got a zero for a short duration of time. So I'm going to call this an accidental zero. Right? That was an accident. I didn't me. I didn't want that to happen. It happened. Uh, let's see. Let's monitor the situation by taking a look at timing diagrams. What are these? These are waveforms for x, x complement, f. Their levels are being monitored as a function of time. So you have a time scale that is provided in nanoseconds. So you've got 20 nanoseconds there, 40 nanoseconds over there and so on. So the x axis is time and the y axis is amplitude. So let's try to take a look. Irrespective of what x is, you would have expected this f to be at a high level all the time. But it's not the case. You see this? There's a problem. There's a problem. There is a problem. Those are your accidental zeros. Let us highlight them in blue because we have been using blues for that, right? That's your accidental zero. You don't want that because x plus x complement should be one. That's an accidental zero. But more importantly, try to take a look at when that happens. Does it happen when x changes or does it happen when x changes from one to a zero only. You see over here, x changed from zero to a one. X changed from zero to a one, but nothing happened because the other guy was one during that time. Holding things to one, this is an R function, right? So if one of them is a one, the output will be, will be maintained at one. That's not the problem. The problem is when one goes to zero, but the other guy takes its time to go to zero. That's when the problem happens. So the problem is when X goes from one to zero. Absolutely. There. Oh, come on. There and there. So the changes over here that are causing this accidental zero are X changing from one to zero. So I can write a statement over here saying glitch, which means error or a slip when X goes from one to zero. This is uh, a, a very common uh, misunderstanding when it comes to hazards. It is not about whether the input changes or not. It is more specific than that. It is about if the change is from one to zero or if this this circuit was a product of some circuit then the change would have to be from zero to a one to cause that accidental one. Uh, is that accidental zero uh, is called a glitch? Yes, that's exactly right. So getting, an, uh, getting the function output, which is inconsistent from what you expect from the logic function itself is called a glitch. It literally means slip or error. Very simple function, right? One function, uh, one input, and we were allowing that input to change from zero to a one, but, uh, and one to a zero, but the problem happened for a very, very short duration of time when that input changed from one to a zero. All right, so there's a question in the chat box. Should the F line be shifted a tiny bit to the left is, uh, how come? So this caused that, right? 
so the moment this went to zero that went to zero this went to zero uh so there is there is a there is a there are delays right the or gate also has a delay yeah yeah that's right there is a delay in the or gate too yes Okay, so that's, uh, I, I'm hoping that this kind of raises your concerns about how are we going to actually implement uh, functions that uh, do not have this problem. Because guess what? When you actually use logic circuits to uh, design for certain applications, those applications can have this problem where, for example, if you don't cover for these situations, the alarm goes off accidentally, right? And you don't want that to happen. Of course, that would be called a false alarm. So you would need to eliminate such situations. That's what our lecture is going to be about. How do you detect and eliminate such situations? The, the situations themselves are going to be called a hazard being present or not. So let's define what are glitches and hazards. A glitch is an unwanted transient in a circuit, which is different from what you expected in steady state. So in steady state, we expected F to be a one. However, during transient, during the changes of X from one to zero, we got an unwanted or unexpected result. That is a glitch. It's also called as logic noise. Literally, it means a slip or error. And it is caused by the propagation delay and the timing defects in combinational logic circuits. One path is longer than the other. That's a problem. So you have got to work hard as a designer to make sure that all the wiring from one stage of a circuit to another stage of the circuit is of equal length so that these timing defects do not cause some uh, some problems, right? Like unex unexpected transients. Now, the difference between a glitch and a hazard is glitch is a problem, an unwanted result. A hazard is present in a circuit when a glitch can occur under some input conditions. You see that? The, so when an error can occur, so hazard is a possibility, uh, is a property of a circuit. Yes. So you're talking about hazards as a possible glitch or not, right? Like a glitch is an error. If there is a possibility of a glitch, then it's a hazard. So by looking at this, would you see, would you say that hazard is present over here or hazard is absent over here. Present, right? So a hazard is present over here. Hazard is present. And the reason is a glitch occurred under some input conditions. What, are, what were those input conditions when X went from one to zero? That was the input condition. Uh, so a glitch is a result of a physical property of a circuit. That's right. physical property which is you know the, that property is gate delay or it could be wiring delay right so it, it could be also the delay through the wire if you are uh, looking at some really high speed applications then even a small change in the length of the wire could start mattering but a gate delay is a little bit more than the wiring delay so we are we are focusing right now on the gate delay all right, let's talk about that. Let's do uh, All right, topping, timing. Snaking the PCB trace to eliminate that. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, careful designers design for the worst case scenario. So, for example, if you have, uh, you know, some part of the circuit here, another part of the circuit here, and say there are four outputs over here that need to be connected to four inputs over here on a PCB, you would have to draw traces from one end to the other. But when you're doing this in as a schematic, well, as a schematic, sure, no problem. Let's do it like that, right? 
no problem and they all can be of same length however when you start putting this onto a pcb things are not as straightforward as that it may be but in general it is not that case uh, and especially if you have a lot more components you know over here and over here on the real estate or you have a lot more com components here uh, some chips some resistors some capacitors then you would have to route the wire around those situations so you what you will usually see is you know things like a 120 degree bend in the in the uh, wiring traces so it'll go all right let's go there then go there then go there and then then they go there then go there then go there and so on right so because there are also some repercussions if I do I if I bend the wire at a steep angle then that causes uh, interference so I, I don't want to also do that I, I would want to uh, you know put it at a 120 degree angle uh, to go around certain uh, physical components that could that could be there um, and you know if you pick up a PCB and you take a look at all the wiring inside it you will see these patterns uh, you know 16 at a time 32 at a time going from one end to the other so all of that is to cover for this right in order to make sure that the timing defects are not going to cause any problem okay let's say, come back to this propagation delay propagation and you know it's it's almost like uh, you know the designers spend a lot of time uh, doing this and you know they, they have to be very careful about that it's almost like art uh, at certain point it becomes art propagation delay and gate delay what is the difference yes yep uh, propagation delay is for the entire circuit so the time it takes for a change in the input to affect the output of a circuit that is called the propagation delay so it's end to end the whole circuit for a gate delay, it is not for the entire circuit, it is specifically for each gate. So time for the change at input of a gate to cause a change at the output of a gate. That small time is going to be gate delay. And I hope you uh, see that gate delay is going to be much smaller than a propagation delay. And it directly depends on the, the number of gates in a circuit, and the, the gate delay of each of those gates and gate delay is the primary component of propagation delay you also have delays through wires but those are very small in comparison to a gate delay so careful designers design for the worst case so they take uh they're called serpentine traces that's exactly right uh, they, they they take the longest trace uh they have to have and then they um, make all the other traces of that length. That's called designing for worst case. Okay, let's move on. What are the type of hazards we are going to worry about? We are going to worry about static hazards, but we are also going to learn about what are dynamic hazards and what are function hazards. We'll spend most of our time on static hazards. We'll try to not only detect this, but we'll also try to eliminate this. Static hazards, how are they different from the other hazards? Over here, we are only going to look at a single input changing. Only one input changing. Uh, like X, we only changed X earlier. Uh, we are not going to try to see whether we get glitches by changing multiple inputs we are just going to worry about one uh, input changing so a glitch that occurs in a logically steady state of zero or one output when a single input changes and there are two categories of static hazards there is a static one hazard also called as the sum of product hazard that's what we, we looked at earlier in which we end with an accidental zero. So all of these are pointing to the same thing, static one hazard, SOP hazard, and accidental zero. And one such example for static one hazard was right here. 
this is a sum of product circuit this uh, ha because it has or gate at the very end we got an accidental zero in it so this would qualify as a static one hazard being present the other case of course is static zero hazard which is the other category in which you have a product of some circuit so it's also called as a product of some hazard in which you actually get an accidental zero static zero hazard so you got to be a little bit careful about the terminology here because static one is accidental zero so but the, the, the point is accidental one happens when your input changes from one to zero and accidental one happens sorry accidental zero in sum of product happens when your input changes from one to zero and in the pos hazard you get an accidental one when your input changes from zero to a one and not the other way around and we'll take a look at a lot of examples here so to 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 see whether that's true or not now how about other types of hazards dynamic hazards this is still a single input changing still a single input however it has three or more delay asymmetries in the path to the output so single input but more importantly the way to distinguish between a static and a dynamic hazard is it has to have three or more delay asymmetries all the way from input to that from that particular single input all the way to the output what that does is you see over here when the input change changed from 1 to 0 you got an accidental zero but then after that it was it was fine but in the dynamic hazard case you will have multiple transitions before it stabilizes because of those multiple delay asymmetries so things are going to be reflected the changes at the input will be reflected at the output at multiple times uh, is that possible it never stabilizes sure if it if your uh, uh, if the delay asymmetries are uh, a lot and those times are more than the time between each input changing yeah sure it never it, it will never stabilize then so that's dynamic hazard in which you are still in which you are still looking at one input changing but more importantly you are looking at whether or not there are three or more delay asymmetries all the way to the output from that single input function hazards are a lot more advanced because over here you end up into a lot of uh, possibilities because this is two or more inputs that are changing at the same time so that can lead to a lot of uh, uh possibilities so we will try to uh, recognize this we will try to see an example but we are not going to go and actually fix dynamic hazards and function hazards we will be focusing on static hazards uh, well one way of uh, fixing dynamic hazards is uh, to limit the number of delay asymmetries like if you if you bring it down to uh, uh less than two uh, less than three then you 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 will be fine here is a static one hazard static one hazard was also called what it was a sum of product hazard and here it is it's a sum of product circuit product product and sum of product so static one hazard is may be present static one hazard may be present in some of product circuits in which you get an accidental zero so let's try to see this uh, the behavior of this circuit you have a and gate and gate and you have an or gate over here you have three inputs x y and z and to be able to look at static one hazards we only change one input we are only changing z here we are fixing x to a 1 we are fixing y to a 1 what is the function itself it is x and z complement 
or y and z there's a question in the chat box are we assuming wires are instant yes we are so we are assuming that the time it takes to go through a particular wire is zero and we are doing that assumption because when you compare it with gate delay it is negligible so we are actually neglecting it and thinking of it as a zero so the function itself x and z complement or x y and z that's the function that we have drawn up using this particular logic diagram this is x and z complement this is y and z and you are doing an r to get the f now if you look more closely at that function if you were to hold x and y to a one don't change them let's just make x1 y1 no matter what z is f will be one right that's the function because you have z complement here you have z there no matter what no matter what z is z complement or z will be a one one ended with the other one is bound to give you a one so that's the condition right we have made sure that happens x is a one here we have forced it y is a one here we have forced it so we have taken care of this situation here let me highlight that in pink taken care of that we have taken care of that now we are focusing on z we are changing it zero to a one one to zero we are keep changing it so based on the function itself we would expect it to be a one but is it going to be a one no as you can see you had an accidental zero here you had an accidental zero here and this was soon after z changed from one to a zero so z changed from z one to a zero here and that caused that particular glitch and i see one here which means that z went from one to a zero just before uh, this diagram which is not shown right so this guy this guy caused that problem. Only when z goes from 1 to 0, you get an accidental 0 in f. You didn't want that. You didn't expect that. All the other waveforms are also sketched over here just for you to kind of uh, monitor the progress of changes in z through the circuit, right? Z changes. Then z prime z prime or z complement changes. X is a one all the time. Y is a one all the time. Uh, but we are changing z, and so the re the rest of the timing waveforms are just there for uh, the sake of completeness. But the problem that we are trying to recognize here is this: f is a zero. Cannot happen. Could not happen. F should have been a one. So how do you fix it? We clearly know that you have a problem here because uh, static so because we got an accidental zero so in order to help you guys fix it i will use k maps and add the redundant prime implicant so i've taken the original function here x and z complement or y and z i have entered that function into the k map and i've highlighted each of those product terms for example x and z complement is uh, which one x and z complement is the horizontal top one then y and z is the second one and after you group them try to look at the redundant prime implicant in this case you will see that there is a rpi that we are not having in our function we don't have that in the function what is that rpi it is x and y which means if i were to add x and y product term to my function i would not be changing the logic function but i will be covering for the case where z changes right so the problem is z is changing right let us try to avoid that let us try to cover for that uh, is there a way 
easier way to determine if a circuit has a hazard without going through the timing. Uh, yes, try to put it put that function into a kmap and uh, see if there are any redundant prime implicants that you have not covered. Or for uh, a few variables, for example, if you have three variables, uh, you could directly identify what we call a coupled variable and residue. So the residue, the product of the residue is actually your redundant prime implicant. So we'll take a look at all those things as we go on. But to answer your question in general, put it into a K-map, see if you did not, uh, did not, if you can add some RPIs. So we want to cover 100% of the prime implicants. Yes, that's, that's it, right? Because if you cover all the prime implicants, and then it is the same function. But now you have added on that RPI, which will, you see this RPI, it is covering when X is a one, Y is a one, but Z was changing, right? So this is covering for the situation where, where Z changes. That's how we are getting, getting rid of that. And the problem was not when Z was changing from one to zero, a zero to one, the problem was only for when Z was changing from one to a zero. All right, so let's try to revisit that. Th that's your RPI, by the way. So let's just, by adding that redundant prime implicant, we have made sure that that particular term will always be a one as long as X is a one and Y is a one. And we have made that independent of Z. The moment we make it independent of Z, no matter what happens here, it will continue to be a one at the output because X and Y are taking care of that. And what we have to be absolutely sure of is we don't change the logic function while doing this. Uh, so if 100% of the prime implicants aren't covered, we will get a hazard all the, we, uh, you're right, we will get a hazard, we may get a glitch, right? So for example, what if Z never changes from one to zero, right? If that doesn't happen, but your circuit is still this, then you will never get a glitch, right? So it's a, it's a possibility we are talking about. Let's move forward. So uh, we have identified the redundant prime implicant for the same function. We have added it to our initial essential prime implicants. And this prime implicant here, this redundant prime implicant here, will take care of Z changing from one to zero. Because as long as X is one and Y is one, X and Y will be a one. So no matter what happens here, this guy will be a one, one or anything is a one. Questions about this? Okay, so our glitch-free circuit, glitch-free equivalent circuit with one gate added looks like this. We have taken X, we have taken Y, we have put them through an AND gate to give us X and Y. That was our redundant prime implicant. Also called as the product of the residues. We'll talk about what is residue, what is coupled variable uh, in a little bit, but that is also an alternate way of, uh, you know, talking about hazard covers. And once you do that, you have X, you have Y, you have Z, Z is changing the same way as before. Z prime is changing the same way as before. You have Y and Z, X and Z prime. All of these are exactly the way they were before. However, because of this X and Y term, F is going to be all always one. No more accidental zeros. So we have fixed it, right? So we have detected a static one hazard. And by looking at a K map and adding the RPI term, we have fixed the static one hazard. Dynamic hazard. 
we will only be looking at uh, an example we will not be fixing it this happens in multi-level circuits how many levels do you see over here how many levels uh, ignore the ignore the, the knots how many levels do you see in this circuit three levels right there are three levels in this circuit so here here and here you could actually put this gate in the first level that doesn't really matter though there there are three levels in this circuit so let's try to take a look at we are still changing only one variable we are still changing x we are just changing x y is fixated at 0 z is fixated at uh, 1 w is fixated at 0 right so four variable case w x y and z three of them are fixed only one of them is changing x is changing let's try to take a look at the function itself we have w and x or x complement and y or w complement and x complement and z what that means is if you put it up put it into a uh, a, a, a truth table as long as w is a zero y is a zero z is a one if x is 0, f should be 1. And if x is a 1, f should be 0. It should not be changing. If x is 0, you should see a 1. If x is 1, you should see a 0. That's it. But over here, you see this? You get multiple changes before it stabilizes. Because the changes that you made in x at the beginning, those will be traveling through here. Those will be traveling through here. Those will also be traveling through here. There are three paths, right? Let's let's try to draw them. Uh, let me use pink here for the. That's one path. The second path is right there and the third path is right there and if you assume that our gate has four nanoseconds and our gate with one of the inputs inverted has eight nanoseconds you see you have 4 plus x plus 4 so if you say 4 plus 4 plus 4 that's 12 here you have 8 plus 4 plus 4 you have got 16 this is 4 plus 4 and 4 right so you've got multiple paths to the output in this case 3 or more in this case 3 bringing the changes in x to f at three different times which is what causes this multiple transitions at the output so literally to identify dynamic hazards what you're doing is you are trying to check whether or not you have three or more delay asymmetries to the output or not from that single input changing if you have three or more uh, uh, paths with different timing then you may have a dynamic hazard uh, a glitch due to that dynamic hazard being present so you're looking at different paths for dynamic hazard still only one input changing next we have an example of function hazard and we are going to do the same thing here we are just going to identify it but we are not going to fix it no easy fix here so the function that we are looking at is f equals x or y complement. We are changing x, we are changing y and it has to go through a NOT gate and then a, an OR gate. But the logic function itself dictates these statements. f should be 1 when x and y both are 1 or if both of them are 0. So if x and y are equal then f 
equals x or y complement should always be 1. x and y is 1 or x and y is 0, it should be a 1 as long as I hold both of them to be the same. Now, let's see, let's see this in the timing diagram. I have, I have an x, I have a y, right? As long as I have x and y to be the same, I should have x uh, of f to be a 1. But if I zoom in over here, x is a 1, y is a 1, x is a 0, y is a 0. But the change in x is happening exactly at the same time as change in y. And because of that little not gate present, we are going to get a non one value, a zero value. We expected a one, we got a zero. This is an accident. That would qualify as a function hazard in which you have more than one input changing at the same time. F should have remained a one. It is not. So we've got three scenarios here for static hazard, dynamic hazard, and function hazard. Is there a term for dynamic function hazard? Uh, dynamic function hazard would be qualified as a function hazard. Uh, so for function hazard to happen, you would, ha you would need two inputs to change. And the moment you have two inputs changing, you would qualify that as a function hazard. Because they are, they are, they are, uh, uh, the constraints for it to be dynamic is stringent, right? Only one variable can change. All right. Now some more definitions. And this time it's going to be easy. Because if we look at uh, EPI and PI and RPI and all those terms, the terms that you are listed over here are going to be pretty easy to catch. There are three of them. One is the coupled variable. What is the coupled variable? Well, a coupled variable, for example, if there is a function as x and y or x complement and z, x would be the coupled variable. It is represented in its true, true form with y and it is in its complemented form with z. So if there is a variable which is complemented in one term of the output and uncomplemented or true in the other, it is called a coupled variable. So it is present in its true form here. It is present in its complemented form here. X is the coupled variable. The coupled term is a product, is a term with only one coupled variable. There is a coupled variable present here, that's a coupled term. There is a coupled variable present here, that is a coupled term. So both of these are coupled terms, x, y, x complement z. The residue is remove the coupled variable from the coupled terms and you have the residue. So if I were to remove x from here, I will be left with y, the residue. If I remove the coupled variable here, I will be left with z. So y and z are called residues. Then the redundant prime implicant is simply the product of the residues. So y and z, you make a product because we are looking at the sum of product examples over here. That would be the redundant prime implicant. It would also be called as the consensus term and that would fix or eliminate the static hazard. We have seen this exact example with this guy. With just a minor changes. What was the um, coupled variable in this example? Z, right? Z is the coupled variable. How about the coupled term? That both of them, X and Z complement, Y and Z. Both of them were 
coupled terms. What was the residue? X, Y, residues. How about the RPI? X and Y. There you go. So, by just looking at, you know, the, the coupled variable and all of that, you can just quickly uh, uh, find out the redundant prime implicant, which we also did using K-maps. So, you have two ways now. One in which you use a K-map can be applicable for three variable, four variable, five variable, and so on. Because we know how to do three variable K-map, four variable K-map, five variable K-map. But the, the process for, you know, just noting down the coupled variables and residues and all that, it works well for fewer variables. For, so we are going to use uh, the terminology of coupled terms, residues uh, for three variable cases. If you encounter four or more variables, then you go for K-maps. Mm, right, there you go. And you know, there is a there is a particular reason why this is called the consensus term. The RPI is also called as the consensus term. It is used to cover the hazard situation. And the reason is because of the consensus theorem, Boolean algebra property number 17 is this. B A property 17 is this that's exactly what we are using here uh, which is x complement and z or x and y uh, this can be the right or y and z equals x that's your consensus theorem that's literally what we did we didn't change the logic function we simply took the residues, we made the product of the residues and added that consensus term, they are both the same. So this is property 17, uh, I think 17a. So that's how all of those things are related. All right. Now, how do you get the hazard cover? This should be like very straightforward. Let's just run through this. We are trying to do this for both the sum of product case and also for the product of some case. Let's work with the product of some case because we have not seen that example just yet. What is the coupled variable? X in true form, X in complement form. X is the coupled variable. What is the residue? Leave X, what remains is Y, Z. So y and z are residues. Both those terms, this guy as well as this guy, had the coupled variable. So both these guys are going to be the coupled terms. Now let's do the sum, not the product, because that was for the SOP. Now let's do the sum. Y or z will be the RPI or the consensus term or the hazard cover for the product of some form. Let us highlight that in pink. And that's what we did over here. We just ended that last term, the RPI term. So this is Boolean algebra property 17a, this is Boolean algebra property 17b. And we are leveraging those properties to fix static hazards. If you are working in the, you know, this, the first form, you are fixing static one hazards. And this one is to fix the static zero hazards. SOP, POS. Accidental what? Uh, accidental zero here, accidental one here. Some more examples. We have 
a static hazard detection problem. Our function is given to us as a complement and b or a and c. So we can because this is just three variables, we can actually take the kmap approach or we can take the uh, terminology approach. Either way, we should get the same answer. So let's try to identify the coupled term, coupled term, uh, coupled variable, coupled terms, residue, and RPI. So what we see here is A is being represented here in its complemented form. A is being represented in its two form. So A should be our coupled variable. If you leave out A from those two terms, you get the residue. So the residue should be B and C. You take the product of the residues, you get the redundant prime implicant. And by simply adding that redundant prime implicant to our sum of product form, we have fixed the static one hazard. So this is specifically for the static one hazard. Now, you get the same situation, right? If you look at it in terms of a K-map, you get to the same conclusion. You have taken the two terms here and you have translated them into the K-map. A complement and B, where is that? Uh, it looks like that is this guy, right? And the other one, A and C, goes right here. So you have got the two blue boxes, two groups of two ones. And once you look at it carefully, you see that you have not covered the situation when you move from this box to this box. You have not covered that. That is, what is that? What is that is B, uh, sorry, A. A, when it changes from 1 to a 0, from this to this, you have not covered that. You may get an accidental 0. That is the only time that is possible, not the other way around. You don't care about whether A changes from 0 to 1 or not. No, it's not. It's not going to give you a, a, a glitch. The problem is when it changes from a 1 to a 0. So let me highlight that over here. 1 to a 0 for A, that's the problem. So by adding that product term, which is what? The red group is what? B and C. By adding that term, you have fixed that static one hazard. So you no longer get the accidental zero. How do you determine which way it's going to give a glitch? It has to give, again, this is, this is a sum of product, right? SOP. So what is the last gate? This is R. If it's an R, it is very easy to keep things at one. The problem becomes the zero, right? So the, if one of them is a one, the output will be a one. But if one of them is changing, static one, yes. If one of them is changing from one to zero, it changed to zero, the other, one, other guy could also be zero during that same time. Right, so for SOP hazard, it has to be an accidental zero that could happen when the change is from one to zero only. It has to be from one to zero. And the situation is exactly the opposite when you look at uh, POS forms. The change has to be from zero to a one for you to get an accidental one in that case. So, you know, to answer your question in, uh, in more generic terms, it is because of the properties of the OR gate versus the AND gate. Let's do this example. So you have a K-map here, four variable K-map. My first uh, uh, goal is to find the simplest sum of product expression for F or some function which is related to uh, A, B, C and D. My second uh, question is, list the conditions in which static one hazard 
is possible right so static one hazard is present or not and whether the glitch is possible or not so what would you say in terms of simplest sop how many groups and all of that simplest by the way so you're not looking at all the prime implicants you are just going for the simplest implementation all right one of four and two of all right so let's try to see this let's do it in blue four is fine i agree with that and then you have got uh, one of two of two right i hope you guys are agreeing with uh, these choices now let's try to list them out uh, so i got this as what uh, let's see b is a zero c is a one and for this guy what do i have uh, b is a one c is a zero b is a zero and for the last one and what do you have here a is a zero c is a zero d is a one perfect so my simplest sop would be f equals b complement and c or b and c complement and d complement or uh, a complement c complement d right now my goal is to find the conditions in which we could have a glitch so first question is there static one hazard possible Static one hazard is it possible? I'm only focusing on SOP forms here, right? Because I'm I've listed the ones. I'm not grouping the zeros here. Static one hazard possible? Question mark. Yes or no, guys? Yes. Let's try to identify the redundant prime implicants that can save us. Actually, there are two of them. One is right there. The other is right there. Once you have identified the, the redundant prime implicants, just because I want to translate this into statements, I'm going to number this. Uh, actually, well, let's talk about the product term there. Product term for the red guy. Uh, let's call that one. Referring, uh, referring that to as product one. And my term is A complement uh, B uh, C complement. And then for this guy, which is number two, I've got a complement, B complement, what else? D. So let's try to do one after the other. Term one. What is the condition there? A static hazard. Is it present or not? We said it is present. So for the first condition, it would be uh, static hazard is present and an accidental zero happens when what changes? For the first term, what changes from what to what? Okay, D changes, uh, but for the so for the first term, which is right here, D is changing, but it is changing from what to what? One to zero. Yes. When D changes, 
from 1 to 0 while A is a 0, B is a 1, C is also a 0. You guys see that? That would be the complete condition. As I hold A0, B1, C0, and I try to change 1, D from 1 to 0, that's going to be my problem. And similarly, we can do this for term 2. Let me do that over here. Term 2. I don't want to write all of that again. I'm going to copy this. Paste it here. And let's try to identify what you need to change. So static one hazard is present and an accident of zero happens when what changes from one to zero? And I'm gonna rewrite this. So for the second case, who is gonna change and cause a problem? C, okay, C is changing from one to zero, right? So C changes from one to zero while A is a what, B is a what, and D is a what? A is a blank. So while C is changing from one to zero, what are, I cannot change all the others, right? A is zero, B is zero, D is one. All right, A is zero, B is zero, D is one. Sure. Perfect. So those are the two conditions in which a static, a glitch may occur. Questions about this example? And we have fixed it, right? We have our fix is going to be this. So I can also write plus. The fix is a complement b, b complement or a complement b complement b. So that's my fix. So we started out with three product terms. We ended up with five product terms for the same logic function. In other words, they will have the same truth table. However, one had static one has it present and the other did not. All right, so I hope you, uh, you got a good understanding with that example. Let us turn our attention to a static zero or a product of some hazard in which we get an accidental one. So now we have certain zeros listed in the K map. Again, we are going to try to do simplest POS and then we'll start to identify the conditions. So how about the simplest POS? I see a group of four zeros there. Then I see a group there. And lastly, I see a group there. So I've got three groups there. Some of product greater than. So you, what does that mean? Greater than, greater than. Uh, as in like you like SOP or it is easier or what? Or transitioning from SOP to POS. SOP is so much better. <laughs> All right. It, it's just grouping the ones and the zeros. So, you know, whenever you uh, flip a coin, you, it, you always call heads. That would not be very uh, random, right? Sometimes you call tails too. Easier to write and look at. Yeah, that I agree. Yes. Yes. It is easier. Yes. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Simplest POS for this function F. Uh, let's try to do this with um, directly. So for the group of four, uh, B is a one. 
and C is a 1. Now for the next group of two zeros, A is just on the, on the top of that 4. Uh, A is a 1. Uh, B is changing. C is a 0. D is a 1. And then on top of that, I got my third term, third sum term as uh, B is a 0. C is a 0. D is a 0. Right? That would be my simplest POS. <laughs> That is the first time I've heard of it that way. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the uh, static zero fix. Are there any redundant prime implicants that I can add in red? Where should I add? So it looks like I have missed one here. And I have missed one here. All right, so what would those terms be? And I can we can write that in red here. It would be A is a 1, B is a 1, and D is a 1. And the next one ended with A is a 1, B is a 0, C is a 0. So those two would be my fix. So I've got the simplest in here. That's my simplest. Then I've ended it with two more terms that were the fix. Right. So let's try to identify the conditions. Let's also number them here. This was one, term one, this was term two. All right, so term one, what are what is the statement? Term one. So term one. When D changes from 0 to 1 and A is 1, B is 0, C is 0. So term 1. All right, let's see. Term 1. D is changing from 0 to 1. So that's good. So now static 0 hazard is present and an accidental 1 will happen. When, what do you have? Uh, so for the first one, D changes from 0 to 1 is good. D changes from 0 to 1, only 0 to 1. Uh, while uh, A is a 1, B is a 0, C is a 0. Perfect. Excellent. C, A complement, or B. Uh, yes. C is 0. Uh, a is a 1. B is a 0. Yes. And the same thing we can call for the second condition here. Copy and paste for the second term. Come on. Uh, a little bit too... Let me not write that. So let's just write it, uh, what is changing and what while. So for this term two, uh, C is changing from zero to one. Yes, C changes zero to one, while uh, A is a one, B is a one, and D is a one. So two situations that can lead to a static zero hazard or an accidental one as the output of the circuit. Okay. Questions about these examples. I also want to kind of tie these things together, all of these.
if they aren't don't cares then we can ignore it yes so don't cares will be treated the same way as we would with or without the uh, glitches so the the redundant prime implicants are not a function of don't cares at all they are only a function of the ones or the zeros or, or you know the, the the terms which are not covered so ignore the don't cares All right, so the examples that we did, we just did, those are listed over here. You guys can take a look at the slides, but I feel like we have actually done uh, quite a few examples already. This is the same example as we did. In fact, we just went ahead and, you know, wrote down explicitly what are the conditions in which those two can happen, the, the SOP hazards can happen. Uh, and we did the same thing for the POS. So these are the same examples that we worked out. Um, so nothing to be concerned there. Just to summarize the glitches and hazards topic, the, the terminology is what gets a little bit confusing, right? So static one hazard is an unexpected an, or accidental zero. It will happen only in SOP circuits. Static zero hazard in a, is an accidental one that could happen only in product of some circuits. And you fix those static hazards by adding the consensus term or the RPIs. And the last statement is sort of uh, the, the same statement that we started off with, which is a set of prime implicants is always going to be hazard free because we would have all the prime implicants, which means all the RPIs as well. All right, so let's, uh, let's see. I, I think I have a question here. Would you always do this or is this only for things where glitches are bad so you, you don't do this always uh, you do this only for cases where you have to cover for these situations you don't do them always again there is a trade-off right you want to prevent a glitch from happening then you have to invest more in in those additional gates so again there is a trade-off you don't always do this what would be applications uh, so any logic circuit, right? Any logic circuit, if you think about, uh, let's see, I have, say, after, I have some logic circuit, right? Which is monitoring, you know, a temperature or force or some, some something that is uh, a physical quantity. You would translate that into a, uh, a, a, a binary input. Okay, you have, four inputs you have one output or maybe two outputs maybe this is a combinational lock and you're trying to say all right you enter these four keys and you open the lock so open the lock might be the output those keys will be the input no matter what that is inside this block inside this box what you will have are a bunch of logic gates and those logic gates if they are implemented in SOP form versus POS form, you could have that accidental output, right? So maybe you wanted to make it, make the alarm goes off, but for some time it didn't go off, right? So, or you didn't want that to open, but it accidentally opened for a very short duration of time, right? So that can spoil the application. So it, it, it really boils down to uh, whether the user is in, interested and invested in covering for those kind of situations. All right, so let's, uh, I'm gonna stop recording here.